Forum present. Put that question there that I report. Put that. The question is that I report a resolution to the House. Those that are quest opinion say aye. So. Those that <laughs> Shh. Cut it out, Julian. Keep quiet. The eyes have it. Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, <laughs> what a night. What a night. I have to report that the committee has agreed to a resolution. Um, I call the minister. I move the report be adopted. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye, the contrary no. I think the ayes have it. Mr. Clark. Order of the day number six, broadcasting amendment bill number two, resumption of debate on the second reading. I understand it's the wish of the House to debate this order of the day concurrently with orders day number seven and eight. There being no objection, the chair will allow that course to be followed. Uh, the question is that the bill be read a second time. Call the honourable member Thank you, for uh, Madam uh, Deputy Chair. I just might point out for the benefit of honourable members that uh, the quorum, calling of the quorum recently occurred was to help the uh, deputy chairman that is now in the chair who would have had to have found himself in the position where he's in. It was a constructive quorum, I think that was the term that I was looking for, <laughs> to allow the uh, deputy chairman to be in two places at the one time, which was going to be physically impossible. Certainly since he's lost weight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Mr Deputy Chair, uh, the, uh, the bills that we're debating in Cognate tonight uh, are three bills introduced by the government to give effect to uh, Firstly, a change in the budget and uh, also uh, with regard to fees for radio, but also to facilitate uh, a faster uh, treatment of applications for FM licences in regional Australia. Um, I have uh, indicated previously, but I do so again, that the three bills uh, will enjoy the support of the, uh, the coalition and uh, uh, we welcome them, although, of course, we uh, would have some uh, reservations. This matter has been uh, uh, in contemplation for some considerable period of time, Deputy Chair, and uh, I'll be making some remarks about that. The uh, measures in these uh, three bills um, will allow the faster delivery of new FM commercial and supplementary radio services to regional listeners under the regional radio program, and they will also implement measures announced, as I said, in the, <laughs> not you again, in the budget. <laughs> um, and I might say to the Secretary who's just arrived, I'm agreeing with these bills. <laughs> they also implement measures announced in the budget to halve the current level of annual commercial uh, supplementary and remote radio licence fees and to streamline the taxation arrangements for uh, broadcasting licences. The licensees. The regional radio program amendments replace the current establishment and AM FM conversion fees with an FM access fee to be paid by all commercial and supplementary non-metropolitan radio licensees before they commence service on the FM band. And they permit a supplementary radio licence to serve an area smaller than that served by the related commercial radio licences. They also enable a uh, supplementary radio licence to be separated from the related commercial radio licence two years after the commencement of the supplementary service. The annual licence fees amendments bill, which is a separate bill, will cut in half the annual licence fees payable for commercial and supplementary and remote radio licences, and they will establish a procedure for self-assessment by licensees of annual licence fees. There will be a requirement to pay all annual licence fees on the 31st of December each year for commercial supplementary and remote radio services and commercial and remote television services, and that's the third bill that relates to television licences. The concession that's provided to uh, to the uh, radio industry by way of uh, licence fee reduction amounts to about $8 million a year. One of the interesting features that, if time permits, I might uh, comment on later on is that there is going to be a, an FM access fee, and uh, it is, in my view, a, a double-dip uh, fee. And I know that the uh, government was approached by uh, many in the uh, industry to see whether or not that double-dipping by the Commonwealth uh, could be, be avoided, and uh, there was a group called Equity and Licence Fees that was uh, uh, put together to make these approaches to the government, but it would appear that uh, their arguments uh, 
haven't been uh, 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 listened to, which I think is regrettable. And, and the basis upon which uh, they put it is that there, was or, there is already an existing fee structure, and this is a double dip, but primarily, of course, that the state of the industry is such that uh, any uh, alleviation of uh, additional fees would at least ensure uh, some continued viability. The question of viability is a matter also that I'll need to raise because this bill uh, winds back substantially the test of financial viability, which is a major criteria for assessment by the Australian Broadcasting Tribunal in issuing licences. As I said, these bills will not be opposed by the Coalition, although uh, on many occasions we have, uh, and as has the industry, expressed uh, concern about the snail-like pace of change uh, under the government and uh, some particular concerns I'll be raising a little later. But taken as a whole, these amendments are a step in the right direction. Uh, and this is not to say the industry will not face considerable hurdles, especially in the present difficult economic climate. However, the radio industry is uh, a mature one, and much of the regulation surrounding it is, uh, is questionable, and it certainly is time for review. Interestingly, uh, the exposure draft uh, of the uh, new Broadcasting Services Bill, which is now in the public arena for some uh, three or four months, recognises this fact. And it, uh, presupposes, uh, if it enjoys the support of the parliament, a dramatic change in how we treat uh, radio uh, in this country. And driving the legislative changes are the rapidly changing and emerging technologies, uh, increased uh, networking and multi-station ownership, all of which we have to recognise. And if more broadcasting channels are to be opened up to new players, then the existing operators must be allowed to operate freely in the more competitive environment that uh, technology is going to force upon uh, the industry and which will be a reality. The immediate impact on the economics of the radio industry may well be negative. They are in a very difficult position now and the emergence of uh, the new technologies may have some negative impacts on uh, some areas. However, the removal of the regulatory stranglehold will in turn create new opportunities and this of course is the area that, uh, that is the most exciting, uh, but it will at the same time bring in tremendous change as the uh, industry copes with the impact of that technology in the mid-1990s. Of some concern to the industry, uh, the primary bill, the Broadcasting Amendment Bill, is the insertion of a new section, Section 80B, in the Broadcasting Act, which restricts the meaning of the term commercial viability. Now, the term commercial viability was a concept applied by the ABT in determining whether a licence would be granted. Uh, broadly speaking, there was a test to see if these uh, services would be commercially viable, and if it was felt they would not be, then a licence wouldn't be granted. So it effectively put in place a barrier uh, to entry uh, to the market, and uh, this has been uh, a consistent approach of policy. What this bill does is wind that back, and uh, that, that in itself uh, is a good thing. But like so much, you must not go just halfway. If you're going to vary and remove that uh, particular centrepiece of policy, then you must also address the other regulations and restrictions, because those other barriers to entry and, and uh, the protection of the existing, uh, existing regime uh, needs to be challenged. And I suppose there's four areas that need to be addressed in this sense, and that's you have to provide uh, adequate and comprehensive services to an area under the existing regime, and that's a fairly high test to meet, and uh, perhaps that ought to be reviewed. And the 20 per cent Australian music content requirement is another matter that would need to be reviewed. And the requirement to meet uh, local newses and uh, 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 localism would be another matter that has to, would need to be reviewed. And of course the issue of uh, the deregulation of the labour market, I mean, the requirements of uh, industry to be locked into uh, awards for the AJA and the PRIA, that's the technicians, all those matters must be reviewed as well. So if you're going to go to a deregulated type of a, an industry, then you must ensure that all the regulations and restrictions and uh, the protection mechanisms that have existed to give us the radio industry that we know, they must be reviewed as well. And that's the point I make. I think the other point that needs to be made is this, that the existing regime gives us relevance in terms of the local market that's being served and reliability. They are features of the existing radio market. Well, they, that will change. 
and uh, as a product of uh, broader policies that would need to be pursued by both governments uh, and oppositions, regardless of which side of the House we might be on. But we're going to see a movement uh, uh, to quantity, and that will, uh, may, may well have uh, some impact on quality. There will be a wider variety of uh, services made available, and uh, there will be more niche uh, 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 programming, there will be smaller audience groups, and uh, therefore there will be far greater choice. Now, under the existing regime, we, we seek greater diversity, but there will even be pressures for the opportunity to provide even greater ranges of choice, but that may well see that some areas of uh, programming will be curtailed, and uh, what I suspect will happen in the early period, there will be more noise um, because most programming will start to move to uh, the music type. But this bill is, uh, is, 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 in my view, a way station on the continuum of the highway to major change. And in that sense, uh, we certainly support it. But what I'm flagging and what I'm indicating is that there is great, uh, greater change yet to come. And uh, whilst this addresses a specific problem in regional Australia, and it's something that we've argued uh, from uh, this side of the House for a long time, as has the industry, a far more liberal approach to allowing FM, a, a technology that's been around for 40 years, to be made available into uh, regional markets. Um, it's not as quick as what uh, certainly I would like. Uh, nor the industry, and I don't agree with the uh, access fee system, but it is certainly a step in the right direction. I would make this point. It's my view, uh, Mr Deputy uh, Speaker, that uh, it's not so much frequency uh, that uh, is important. I think that uh, is format uh, is, uh, is what attracts audience as, as much as frequency, and um, what uh, the audience uh, uh, gets uh, it doesn't determine, it do isn't determined so much by the frequency by which it's delivered, it's the format. And uh, what we want to see, of course, is a viability within the industry. That is currently under threat, but there has to be a recognition that we have to balance those two issues up. And I think uh, the government's fallen down on the side of providing the opportunity for greater sh choice and greater utilisation of emerging technologies, and we would certainly be going in that direction. But I think you have to recognise that there is uh, dramatic uh, uh, revenue uh, difficulties for the industry. And indeed, by coincidence, the Australian Broadcasting Tribunal issued today um, radio advertising figures which show a drop of 3.7 per cent relative to the same period in 1990 for advertising, uh, which of course underpins the, uh, the viability of the radio industry. So they are certainly in a very difficult position. And uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy uh, Speaker, I haven't sought the leave of the Minister at the table, but I'm sure he will grant leave, seek to table a, a graph showing the, uh, the direction of uh, radio revenue based on uh, uh, the industry's uh, figures, which show that the industry has had a particularly difficult time. And if I might make the point that the, um, the uh, issue in Tasmania is one... Uh, table? Yeah, I will. I was just going to have it taken around to show to the Secretary. Uh, the issue in Tasmania shows that the revenues for radio stations in, in that state um, have, have dropped dramatically, I think. Yeah. I, I might say, uh, uh, by way of a complete and total diversion, uh, Mr Deputy Chair, that, that by coincidence you're in the chair, the Secretary's over there, and I'm here, and uh, we won't have tonight a rerun of the SBS debate. Uh, as I did the other evening, and uh, I hope that the, during that debate uh, it would not be construed that I reflected in any way upon your chairmanship. And I won't now. I won't now enter into the debate, but I'm sure that the secretary would know it was not usually in my nature to become so agitated. <laughs> is the honourable member seeking leave? I am to seeking table? leave for that. Is to leave be granted? Yes. Leave is granted. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Chair. <laughs> you tabled a document. I just tabled a document about radio. <laughs> uh, we're not going to discuss SBS tonight. Uh, Mr Deputy Chair, what I was uh, saying, of course, is that the revenue has dropped dramatically for radio, and this uh, has been very, very difficult for the industry. And uh, at the same time, they have to uh, go through a very uh, difficult regulatory regime, and it's clear that uh, that adds to costs. And the issues that I'm raising is that whilst we're having some change here, there are other changes that need to be taken into account. 
As I mentioned, the Broadcasting Services Bill will, if it's supported, give far greater flexibility, but it will not give the features of the existing system. The existing system is now undergoing change, and it is inevitable that that take place, and it's going to be driven by technology, and that technology must be accommodated. Digital audio broadcasting is going to have an impact in the medium term in this country, and that will provide the opportunity with CD quality uh, 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 frequency to uh, deliver services to uh, many more people. There is going to be frequency liberation, and that, of course, uh, compounds the problem of charging monopoly rents, and that's what uh, the current system is about. In country areas, as I've often said, why are they paying a fee? If you're going to have greater frequency liberation, what is the point of uh, having uh, a, a fee system? It seems to me that there should be uh, no economic rent that is sought outside capital cities, and it's only a, a thought, but I wonder whether or not uh, we ought to be treating uh, metropolitan uh, radio regimes and uh, regional country regimes completely uh, differently. Indeed, we do in the television industry in the sense that, uh, as we've tried to pursue a policy in this country of greater diversity in the country by the aggregation policy, we've found, because of the economic pressures uh, that policy has forced on operators to acquire additional capital equipment, there have had to be concessions. They amount to over 100 million and uh, that recognises the difference between uh, networking and uh, metropolitan markets and regional markets. And what you are going to see in emerging technologies in radio is a greater capacity uh, for networking. Indeed, this bill recognises that with the seven station rule, and uh, I wonder whether or not that's a realistic rule. In any event, perhaps it should be lower. But it's clear that there is going to be this change, and that uh, I think to try and equate the needs and opportunities in regional Australia to the metropolitan area by way of seeking the economic rent in the system that we do now is something that ought to be totally and completely reviewed. And it has in part uh, been done so within the regime of the television industry. Mr Deputy Chair, some of the other matters that uh, I wanted to mention, um, and I've already talked about commercial viability, but the watering down of that viability test and the legislative preference given to new players may mean that only in the largest metropolitan markets can the existing stations meet the competition head on by merging or establishing AM FM combinations. In the smallest markets, however, the existing incumbent will be able to establish an FM supplementary, but not without cost and several lean years. It takes about a million dollars, I'm told, by the industry to set up a new station with costs running at about 150 per cent and revenues at about 120 per cent which wipes out profit in the initial establishment years. On the other hand, it does provide the station with the efficiencies which arise from the synergy achieved. An industry prediction is that in the bigger markets, revenues are likely to fall as stations face new competition without the ability to tap extra revenue sources. The anomalies are clear, apparently, in the case of the uh, Wollongong market. There are also uh, issues in my own area. For example, uh, the bill appears to be silent on a number of matters um, in, in the uh, in the city of Launceston, so I can just find that um, well, I can't find it. But anyway, in, in that area, you have uh, the capacity for uh, an applicant to apply for an FM licence, but the uh, proposal is silent on whether or not the other AM operator is able to uh, object. And one has to ask the question: Why it is that uh, an existing AM operator just cannot? Uh, automatically uh, apply to uh, have um, the FM licence. It uh, appears to be something that should be addressed. The competitive challenges facing the commercial radio industry are in broadly three areas. The radio advertising revenues, as I've pointed out from the ABT figures, are likely to experience only modest growth, and this is due in no large part, of course, to the, uh, the recession that we had to have and its accompanying low inflation rates and an economic the an economy that uh, is stubbornly uh, refusing to move out of the doldrums despite the uh, protestations uh, to the contrary by the Prime Minister today. Another reason is, of course, the modest increase in total advertising expenditure in the short to medium term. There is no reason to believe that radio would extract an increasing share of the total and finite advertising, uh, advertising, uh, advertising cake. And the second challenge is that competition is likely to intensify, and that was the point that I was making earlier. We're likely to see more than just one more commercial station in each regional market, 
and two new commercial stations in each metropolitan market by the middle of this decade. This is an acknowledgement of emerging new technologies such as uh, DAB, which I've talked about, and experience overseas. I might just quote uh, in concluding uh, that uh, what has happened in New Zealand. There's been an explosion of uh, radio stations in New Zealand, and in one year, 1990 to 91, the number of commercial radio stations increased from 56 to 75, and all commercial stations increased by 34 per cent, and privately owned commercial stations increased by 86 per cent in the short space of 13 months. And soon there will be 261 stations, and this in a total population of 3.4 million. Australia, by comparison, has 147 commercial radio stations servicing a population of 17.2 million. So I go back to that point I was making earlier. We are emerging, uh, we are emerging out of a fairly restricted regime, recognising that technology is driving that change. We are doing so at a time when the economic revenues to be expected to flow to commercial stations are not going to grow, they're going to be lower, there's going to be greater competition, programming is going to be more narrowly focused, there will be many more stations, and out of that will come uh, somewhat uncertain, I should think, for people like us to be able to, uh, uh, be able to determine what will happen, but it will certainly be different. And what I suspect is that uh, there will be a, 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 an emphasis on quantity and more noise rather than quality. Now, I think the community has to recognise that this change is going to come about. The industry does, reluctant as it is, because it is being, uh, it is being driven. It's not being forced uh, necessarily by governments. I think that the government has been too slow to recognise the changes that are about, and that's in part why we welcome this bill. I think they've tried to put in place a far too restrictive regime with all the tests uh, for localism and uh, content and uh, commercial viability. All those things I mentioned have to be reviewed. But we are going to see change. It is going to go in the direction of uh, the New Zealand model and, and underpinning it. And the secretary at the table, who's an expert in these areas, would know this frequency liberalisation that uh, is going to come about, uh, and I understand that that area itself is going to be subject uh, to uh, a reform, and we've had a parliamentary committee recently report on that area, and we are going to have to come to grips with those issues, but at the end of the day we must make sure that legislation is technologically neutral. We allow the marketplace to take advantage of those technologies. We always will have concerns uh, that the community is going to be serviced by uh, relevant uh, uh, programming where we are able, but if we're going to take the view that we have to be restrictive about that, then I think that's the wrong role for government. But I think the only thing that can be said is that there is going to be tremendous change. And the result of all of this is that future profit growth and perhaps even profit maintenance is going to have to come from continued cost cutting and cost control. And that's why the issues about labour arrangements are so important in this particular industry, because it's the capacity of the stations to pay its staff relating to its audience and uh, its own productivity and uh, its own ability to attract uh, to audience and advertisers that's going to be important and to have as a set constant um, uh, 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 wage levels and so on uh, that can't be negotiated directly with those participating I think uh, is another major barrier that has to be addressed and of course uh, there is even recognition within the uh, Labor Party now that uh, direct uh, labour relations is something that must take place in this country. The final matter that I think is uh, worth uh, making mention of in the uh, bill is another change and it relates to uh, public radio licensees in areas which do not overlap with a commercial radio licence service area will be able to broadcast sponsorship announcements and they will run a total uh, in total for not more than four minutes per hour of broadcasting time. Now, clearly this uh, is a change to allow our public broadcasting to uh, advertise. Indeed, some public broadcasters uh, have been uh, advertising or running sponsorship, and I think the closest local example is the Goulburn station. And uh, clearly uh, what this uh, will mean is that this area also will be out there competing for uh, uh, part of the advertising dash sponsorship market. And, uh, the SBS and the television area are now doing, and, and now the government is permitting uh, public broadcasters to do it. If this uh, takes place, of course, the amount that will be flowing to public broadcasting from government will be scrutinised uh, to see uh, whether or not it 
its amounts that need to be increased because it's basically been government funding and, and a great support from volunteers that have enabled public broadcasting to be uh, in the state that it is in Australia. And it's quite a successful uh, broadcasting. Indeed, the ethnic uh, public broadcasting people came to see me the other day and I was surprised at the extent of the services that they provide to communities around Australia. I think they play a very useful and uh, quite a significant role. I don't always agree with some of the uh, material that's uh, broadcast, uh, but uh, given that uh, we are going to have an explosion of services that are going to be available to the community in a democracy, uh, it's good to see that diversity emerging. And uh, you know, it's going to be cheaper in, in time to probably uh, set up a radio station than it is to buy a, a news agency. Um, and I think that we have to uh, recognise that, that fact and therefore they're going to have greater diversity. So public broadcasting, I think, is playing a role, but it's a significant change for the government to permit uh, sponsorship uh, on the public broadcasters. It's in a very limited form at this stage. I suspect, though, it's, uh, it's the thin edge of the wedge. And uh, I had uh, an interesting quote that uh, we uh, picked up from Sir Dennis Foreman, who was the deputy chairman of the Granada Group in the United Kingdom in the listener in December 1989, and he said this, and I quote, on a national scale, it is dangerous to meddle with the delicate checks and balances of a broadcasting system without calculating the results very carefully. Uh, clearly, his message was that the advertising cake is finite. That's certainly what the, the marketplace will tell you. And if the government gives someone a bigger slice, everyone else gets less and uh, demands a subsidy or goes broke. Well, in an age when subsidies have come to an end, the alternatives are going to be that you will survive or fall on your ability to attract audience, and if you don't uh, do well, then you won't survive. And it's not going to be for governments uh, to be in a position to uh, support uh, your enterprise. And therefore, in that sense, the government has started to embrace a, uh, a very open regime uh, of uh, uh, broadcasting in this country, and the uh, the major debate on this whole central issue will be during the Broadcast Services Bill when it finally comes to this parliament. And that will be a debate that I think uh, will be very, very significant because it does, Mr Chairman, signal that uh, a 50-year-old piece of legislation that has been much amended and uh, is heavily regulatory will be uh, subject to intensive uh, community discussion. And I commend the minister for taking that path. I think that's sensible. He did that with the telecommunications bill. I think it was sensible at the end. We had a much better bill because of it. And indeed, uh, in this area, it's going to be much the same. No one can predict the outcome, but certainly there is a recognition that in this area, a very significant area that touches every Australian home. Every Australian home has a radio, and many, many uh, thousands of Australian homes, uh, and the vast majority have uh, television sets. And we are seeing a tremendous change taking place. It's being driven by technology. We must accept it, and we must accept that there is a lesser role for government in this area, and uh, that is to be welcomed. It's not to be feared, but there will be uh, dramatic and, uh, and, and significant changes in the mix of programming and the diversity of programming that is going to be available to people and the methods by which it is going to be delivered to the community. Finally, uh, Mr uh, Deputy Chairman, the last bill was the Television Licence Fees Bill. All that bill does on this occasion is set a common payment date. Um, it's the 31st of December, and uh, there is no concessions given to the television industry with regard to the amount of fees that they pay. I think, and I would be corrected uh, by the Secretary, but I think it's in the order of $93 million a year. I know at a recent speech, uh, the Federation of Australian television stations, the minister said that he hoped that there would be the capacity to reduce the impost of those fees, which is a super tax on the industry, uh, in the next budget. And uh, I will be one who will be certainly wanting to keep him uh, to that agenda, because uh, they likewise are being used as a taxing point uh, and in a way that is unfair, as is the proposal for the double-dipping FM access fee, which is uh, encapsulated in this proposal that's being debated this evening. Um, with those uh, few remarks, Mr Deputy Speaker, in the very calmest of terms, can I say to the Secretary that we will be supporting these three pieces of legislation. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. The Honourable Member for Burke. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. 
pleasure to appear in the house before you, sir. Um, and, uh, sir, can I uh, commence my uh, contribution by saying that I welcome the decision of the opposition to support this legislation because uh, it's recognised that uh, it, it is required at the moment, it is needed. As uh, has been outlined, the uh, amendments to the Broadcasting Act do define the term commercial viability for the purposes of the licensing provisions. The Radio uh, Licence Fees Act uh, abolishes the uh, current establishment and, and conversion fees to replace them with an FM access fee. And uh, the uh, amendments to the Broadcasting Act do set a common, uh, common date for uh, payment of licence fees under the Television Licence Fees Act. Now, there are some questions that I think can be asked of, uh, of these three pieces of legislation, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I'd like to briefly cover those and some of the answers to them from the government's perspective. Certainly, people are entitled to ask uh, why it is that we are introducing these changes to the Act at the same time as uh, we have, at the moment, a uh, broadcasting amendment bill which is um, uh, about to be distributed publicly for uh, public discussion and consideration. And that is about much more fundamental reform in the industry as a whole. I think the fact of this is, yes, we have recently tabled and released for public discussion a more fundamental approach to overall broadcasting reform than is represented in those three bills. However, particularly in the case of regional radio, Mr Deputy Speaker, we have decided that urgent remedial action is required. Uh, these measures should not be put off pending finalisation of the broader review. And uh, I think it's true to say that the legislative changes which will result from the Broadcasting Services Bill, the broader reform, there's very little prospect of those being implemented before July next year, and uh, therefore there is a need for these transitional arrangements to go ahead. I might say at the outset too, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the Minister, Mr Beasley, and the, uh, and the Parliamentary Secretary, Mr Snowden, have uh, widely consulted the uh, various players in the industry and the community in general on, uh, on these measures during the past 15 months. And I know that the, uh, the caucus working group, which uh, specialises particularly in uh, broadcasting issues under the chairmanship of Mr Langmore, has, uh, the member for Fraser, has also worked through a lot of these issues and they all agree with the point that it is important to introduce this uh, these reforms at this point, even though they will certainly be subsumed in a much broader reform towards the middle of next year. One uh, may ask, why are we inserting a definition of commercial viability into the Act in advance of uh, the Broadcasting Services Bill? And perhaps I suppose the question could be asked, uh, why won't this just lead to further legal delays? Wouldn't it be easier to remove it altogether? I think it's important for people to understand, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the proposed definition and the related amendments um, which limit its consideration are intended to limit the pressure on the Australian Broadcasting Tribunal to carry out the exhaustive investigations, often at the behest of parties opposed to the introduction of new services, which they uh, are required to do under the current Act. In this way, we hope to limit the potential for delays in the licensing process. And the delays in the licensing process are something which have been the constant focus of all the bodies presenting before us during the past 12 to 15 months. We also seek to reduce the Tribunal's current obligation to seek independent certainty in assessing commercial viability. We hope to redress the imbalance in past inquiries where, for various reasons, too much emphasis has been placed on the commercial viability criteria at the expense of other equally important considerations, such as the desirability of introducing more services. Mr Deputy Speaker, in respect of the question about favouring independent services and competition, when in fact efficiency, cost and diversity arguments suggest that there may be merit in supporting the introduction of supplementary licence, I'd just like to say this. 
While it's difficult to sub substantiate arguments that supplementary licence are the best way to achieve efficiency and diversity in service provision, we have accepted that in certain cases we do need to keep that option open. There will be areas where um, it, is, it, it has to be admitted that uh, additional independent commercial, commercial radio services are not feasible. And therefore, in certain situations, we do need to maintain the option for the approval of supplementary licences. And this bill therefore introduces streamlining measures, streamlined measures for uh, ways to achieve that, recognising that in some cases a supplementary licence is the most practical way to introduce a new service. But in general, we are in fact saying that in the interests of encouraging diversity of media ownership, it is preferable that a competitive service be introduced wherever it is reasonably practicable to do so, and therefore this bill includes provisions which give a clear preference to commercial radio license, licences over supplementary radio licences. And what that means in, uh, in simple terms in general, Mr Deputy Speaker, is, is where we feel that, uh, that there is the prospect of providing a new radio service, a new licence, we would be looking to the marketplace and looking to uh, people interested in setting up commercially under a principle of commercial viability uh, and they would be granted a licence or able to, uh, to tender for a licence based on those criteria. Where in fact there isn't um, the capacity to provide an additional player, then a supplementary licence for an additional station might be, might be uh, authorised to uh, an existing operator. I think a lot needs to be said, Mr Deputy Speaker, about the new access fee for, uh, for FM radio and uh, in particular the question of uh, why we've chosen to go down the road we have rather than introducing a tender system. Um, while the tender process has been used successfully for AM FM conversion in metropolitan services and was initially proposed for uh, regional radio, it is not compatible with the viability tests and the merit selection procedures for regional radio licences which we've undertaken to maintain pending the completion of consultations on the draft broadcasting services bill. The, um, the current high level of fees has acted to discourage applications for new licences and uh, that's in fact turned out to be contrary in practice to the, uh, to the policy of uh, increasing the number of competing licences. We believe that the current fee structure has contributed to the difficulties that a commercial radio licensee may face in establishing a new service, particularly in the current economic climate uh, when advertising revenues are hard to win and, uh, and the establishment capital required, particularly in the radio market, although it's not nearly as high as newspapers and television, it's still, uh, it's still substantial and, um, and it's in a, uh, in a much smaller revenue market, particularly for advertising. So we, I think, have um, recognised the fact that there is a need to reduce the fees that are involved. We are introducing a fee structure which is more effective in supporting those broadcasting objectives. We believe it will re remove the discriminatory burden on new independent services and we believe it will provide greater equity between new service providers and that it will apply across the board on common principles to independent services, to supplementaries and to AM and FM conversions. Mr Deputy Speaker, we, uh, we are keen to try and reduce the uh, workload of the tribunal in this area, particularly uh, given that there's a number of protracted uh, inquiries currently before the Australian Broadcasting Tribunal. Um, the, uh, the arrangements that we've provided for in the bill, uh, the special transitional arrangements, uh, are intended to um, ensure that enactment of the legislation will provide for those uh, independent applicants to uh, be able to or to come under the regime of the lower fees. In the case of supplementary applications lodged before 
the 23rd of July announcement, no fee will apply on the basis that these applications were lodged on the understanding that no fee would be payable. Um, one might say that this is government by press release, but the fact of the matter is that uh, the statement was made on July 23rd. The uh, expectation was there for people intending to uh, operate in this sector of the industry, and so this legislation gives effect to the fact that uh, applications lodged before July 23 will, um, will proceed on this basis. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think we also should make something of the fact that uh, the government has decided to reduce the level of radio licence fees by 50 per cent. Uh, it's not often that governments reduce charges by 50 per cent, and um, there is a question, I suppose, that could be raised as to why television licence fees aren't being reduced by a similar amount. What we would say about that is that um, we are recognising the fact that the radio industry is becoming increasingly competitive and that uh, the public may be better served by a financially stable commercial radio industry. I think the fact of uh, it is, Mr Deputy Speaker, that um, in, uh, in a time not so long ago when tendering for licences operated, a number of uh, proprietors or intending proprietors did pay uh, prices for their licences which were far beyond the capacity of, uh, of the revenue in the industry to, to support. In other words, they have rendered themselves with high borrowings and high tenderings uh, financially unviable. And that has led to a lot of instability in the industry, and uh, we do see the need to stabilise that. We have given consideration to a similar reduction for television licensees, but we've decided that radio and television are different, and that in this case the uh, first step ought to be to separate the regulation of commercial radio from that of television. And it's interesting that in the, in the broader reform uh, paper that's been issued for public comment, the, uh, the government is canvassing the, uh, canvassing the, um, the question of uh, radio operating without, uh, without restriction and without uh, um, or virtually being accepted that there are so many players in the game that there isn't the need for the same uh, controls on competition and range of audience that might uh, operate otherwise in, in television. So there are considerable differences being flagged in the difference between commercial radio and television. We are recognising the fact that uh, both from uh, the terms of the regional radio plan and the national metropolitan plan that uh, there has been greatly increased competition and at the same time the industry has been coping with rapid technological change. And that's a point that uh, Mr Smith raised in his, uh, in his comments earlier. Um, it is true to say that the industry is, uh, is not going to be uh, stagnant in technology. There will be massive changes and it could be a period as short as five years that we see people receiving their uh, radio radio information, radio broadcasting in completely different technology than that which they are dealing with now, and we need to provide flexible legislation that moves with that. Therefore, our view is that we should increase the number and range of broadcasting services available to the public, and we should not uh, therefore take a high taxing approach to the industry. We're also recognising that the commercial television industry has been experiencing financial difficulties over the past few years, but these problems are largely due to the commercial decisions made by those directly involved, and we don't take responsibility for those decisions. By implication, there is some acceptance of uh, responsibility to some part for the difficulties in the radio industry. However, we are uh, pledging relief, totalling $117 million for commercial tele television licensees who are establishing new commercial services in regional areas under the equalisation policy. So if the question is raised as to why are we doing this for radio, 
and not for television. I think there are very good reasons for the difference, and in fact, uh, it can be demonstrated that we are not without regard for the difficulties in the television industry at the moment. Um, I think, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that uh, I just conclude my remarks by uh, making some comments briefly on the questions of self-assessment and the common due date. Um, that's just to say that the introduction of the licence uh, fee self-assessment scheme and the common due date is intended to simplify both the administration of the current licence fee system and uh, for both licensees and the Australian Broadcasting Tribunal. Payment on uh, the 31st of December does mean that some licensees will have to pay their licence fees for the 1991-92 financial year six months earlier than they would under the current system, but they have known about this change for uh, at least uh, five months now, and um, we believe they've had enough time to plan for the common due date and the downstream benefits of a common date in the industry uh, are there for, I think, everybody to see and understand, and I don't believe it's an issue which will, will cause any real difficulties. Um, I would also make the point, Mr Deputy Speaker, that there are no transitional pro rata provisions included in the bill for the introduction of uh, the 31st of December 1992 due date. This is because um, only the payment due date uh, and not the period for which the fees have calculated has been changed. In other words, licence fees will still be calculated for the financial year, and that means that um, by 31st of December 1992, they will have had plenty of time to plan for that uh, introduction of the common due date. So I think, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that we have uh, given a lot of consideration to these transitional changes. We have looked at the questions that are most likely to be asked um, by the industry and by people interested in these issues. We've tried to accommodate those in the context of a much broader review of broadcasting policy, which I think without question will be one of the most exciting things done in this field for, uh, for many decades, but we have recognised the fact that while that broader review is taking place, while the public uh, comment period is taking place, there is a need to do something immediately in these fields in particular, and that's why we've taken the step of introducing these three bills, knowing full well that they will be subsumed in broader action in about eight months' time, but in the meantime I think it is a response to the industry and the industry will be pleased to see it happening. So uh, I again appreciate the fact that the opposition have chosen to support the legislation. The comments which Mr Smith has made will certainly be uh, taken into account in our deliberations and, uh, and I would therefore conclude by supporting the legislation. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. The Honourable Member for Mitchell. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Chairman of the Caucus Committee normally supports the legislation and he normally runs his own line at the beginning of the event, but the caucus line at the end of the event. Very interesting to watch him perform. Um, thank you for your speech. Uh, it is good tonight that we have uh, uh, an interesting uh, batch of bills, uh, basically non-contentious but important bills, just the same. It would be my view that the government is far too timid in its approach in this area. It needs to be more adventurous and, in fact, take up some of the challenges of microeconomic reform which are so critical to Australia's future. The demand for new and changing services are never more pressing in Australia than they are at the moment, in fact, worldwide. There's a massive change in the way in which the use of the, uh, the radio spectrum, uh, the whole range of broadcasting and telecommunications services are being regarded. It is critical for Australia's future that we take up the challenges of changing technology because we are geographically located in an area which is dependent on technological change. If we cannot take up uh, the advantages, if we are unwilling or held back uh, by any, uh, any uh, means whatsoever, then we jeopardise uh, our future and the options and leadership that we should be showing in our region. It would seem to me that uh, Australia has the uh, chance now of taking a lead in this field, but regrettably some time has been lost uh, through the government's wish to too tightly control 
uh, uh, telecommunications and uh, the use of the broadcast systems. That's unfortunate because it, it is a characteristic of, uh, of uh, Labor Party governments that they cannot uh, arrange a competitive approach where they, uh, they uh, f uh, cannot intervene. Always they must be there, always they must be regulating and intervening. And so that has damaged to a fair degree. Australia's opportunities in this adventurous and exciting field. Um, unfortunately, too, those restrictions on Australia's use of uh, the radio spectrum, telecommunications and broadcasting, uh, is hampered by the role of some very powerful uh, players in the field. And uh, uh, certainly one of the most notable of these must be the control of the telecom unions. And those unions, in fact, are seeking uh, step after step uh, to, to assume uh, control in areas where they currently do not have control and uh, to tighten their control in areas where they are now active. Now, the prospects in this area are massive for Australia. The prospects for employment, the prospects uh, for the development of new skills and semi-trades and, and uh, services can be developed to our advantage and certainly to the job market advantage. And that is why I'm particularly keen, Mr <coughs> Deputy Chairman, that we move quickly into it. If we hang back, as we've hung back in waterfront reform, if we hang back in this area to the same degree, we not only run the risk of losing our international opportunities, but we also run the risk of creating the number of jobs and skills that are so sorely needed in Australia. There would be few areas that I know of, perhaps tourism is another area, but this is certainly one of those areas uh, that Australia can take a lead. We have the intelligence uh, in our uh, uh, citizens, we have the uh, educational levels of uh, people throughout Australia, we have a dedicated and uh, hard-working workforce if they are permitted uh, to operate freely and we should be taking advantage of that. It's intellectual ability really more than anything else in this field and that's where Australia excels and we should be taking the lead in our region. The technological development is fast and unpredictable. Users' preferences cannot in any way be predicted. The, change, uh, the quick change in a small, in, in a, in, uh, some years ago uh, from uh, black and white television to coloured television, I believe, indicates the nature of the Australian community. Those who want to move ahead quickly, those who, who want to take advantage of new technology. Uh, the use of uh, cellular mobile phones is another area which is massively growing as uh, unpredictably Australians have seen the advantage of this new technology and are, are, are reaching out to take advantage of it. It's convenient. It's uh, 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 particularly applicable to the long distances that we have in Australia. It uh, allows the nature of our workplace, both in cities and the country, uh, to be accommodated. And so the unpredictable nature of future demand for services is something that cannot readily be foreseen or coped with by government. Uh, the government processes are not sufficiently flexible, nor far-sighted, nor close enough uh, to the marketplace to understand why it suddenly becomes very convenient for plumbers, builders, carpenters, truckies, all sorts of people who need to be in touch uh, to grab the uh, cellular mobile phone or to take advantage of radio systems. And so those are just two recent examples where there's been a change in technological demand. The government is currently moving to pay television. Nobody can predict how quickly that will be taken up by the Australian community. It may be immensely attractive, it may not be. Cable television is another thing that's in the system sometime down the track. Nobody can predict where we're going to go, what the demands will be, what the possible rewards are there will be for those who take up and present these services to the Australian people. So therefore the unpredictable nature of uh, what we're dealing with here is something that governments are not good at. Technology and government combined um, do not create certainty in the marketplace. And I was very attracted by a comment by uh, Nicholas Negropont of MTI's Media Lab, 
when he outlined the needs for change. And he said, what currently goes through wires, chiefly voice, will move to air. What currently goes through the air, chiefly video, will move to wires. The phone will become wireless, as mobile as a watch and as personal as a wallet. Computer video will run over fibre optic cables in switch digital systems as convenient as the telephone is today. So there's the massive change predicted by one person and the possible complete reversal of the modes of communication. Now, who can predict that? How can government regulate effectively in that area, meet the demands and allow the flexibilities and opportunities that we so desperately need to take us to the forefront in these fields? And so, um, whilst acknowledging the, the, the motion, the, the, the actions to legislate by the government tonight, I am concerned that they are too timid. They are not taking up the opportunities for a major stride in microeconomic reform. Here they could. And the minister, the, the secretary, will get up and say, "Well, you know, in eight months' time, it'll be all in place." But at eight months, people will know what it's about, and then another 12 months for them to gear up and take advantage of it. You're looking at big delays in these systems. There's huge capital investment involved, and so government can't or should not hamper that process by being too ponderous in its decision-making processes. I guess that um, uh, when one looks at the current system as it applies, the regulation of it, uh, one is forced to look at the basic spectrum and how, in, how that is being used. And I was particularly pleased to participate in uh, formulating a report for the parliament prepared by the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Transport, Communications and Infrastructure entitled Management of the Radio Frequency Spectrum, which sought to go to the very basis of the way in which uh, the radio spectrum is used. And it was during that report that uh, the Department of uh, Transport and Communications was asked whether it was the case that incumbent, incumbent users had no continuing rights in the spectrum. And an interesting reply from the department, because it uh, really did start to identify the advantages uh, of being part of the current system and being a current provider of services in the current system. And, and the disabilities against change or new entrants to providing all sorts of services in radio, television or whatever. And the department response said, in a legal sense under the Radio, radio Communications Act, that is so because the licence is awarded on an annual basis, but there is an expectation, and one which is realised expectation, that the licence would get renewed. Indeed, in our arrangements to try to achieve spectrum reallocation, we try to negotiate with people under our current system uh, that shift to occur, sometime five years ahead of time. The expectation is that there, uh, there is there that tenure will continue. And so the system itself, as we have it, is one that does not encourage uh, flexibility. Is not one that encourages the development of new techniques or new technologies. Now, in examining whether our current system is suitable or not, there are a number of approaches that can be adopted, and one can assess whether the current spectrum management practice lacks flexibility and timeliness with regard to changing demand for spectrum use, and that mismatches may occur in supply and demand demonstrating the difficulties involved in predicting developments in technologies. Now, that's not a dynamic system as we have it at the moment. The capacity to be technically efficient in the use of the spectrum and also deliver services in the way that is uh, in the best interest of the Australian community is also limited. Setting of standards imposes costs on new and prospective users and may in some instances benefit existing users. There's got to be a public merit in this whole process. We've got to have police uh, applications of the radio spectrum. We've got to have emergency services. We've got to have things like community radio. And so those uses, in fact, are uses that derive for the community a public benefit, a public good. And then on the other end of the use of uh, radio and broadcasting is the area that we're dealing tonight, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, in case you were concerned, uh, are the use for broadcasting and uh, 
radio and television, and those are the areas of really great commercial value. That's the area where there's great competition to be able to get into the action because using the airwaves is money. If you can get a licence there, it has been until recently the opportunity for a person to, to uh, find their way to quite lucrative returns. In recent days that has not been the case. But I'm sure the House will remember the changes of legislation that passed through this place to advantage friends of the government and the way in which those friends abused uh, uh, that uh, friendship, uh, the way in which the value of their assets rose, and one, uh, certainly I do remember from this side of the House, the way in which those friendships were later repaid at election times. And so, therefore, we have another reason why the government's intrusion in this area is completely inappropriate. Um, the deficiencies of the current system is that I believe that while changes are meant to play a role in regulating demand in congested areas of the spectrum, there's little suggestion to uh, have one believe that this approach really works. And that's the process that we're in tonight, that whether the process the government is adopting really does work, because the government tries to pick how much it should charge, and here we come to the licence fees. The government tries to identify how much it should charge for an economic rent plus a tax on users of highly valuable commercial airwaves. The narrow part of that spectrum that really uh, is highly sought of after it has a commercial use. The government uh, moves in, makes predictions, and its charge is not really based on, on a commercial assessment but based on what the government thinks it should charge. And, uh, one only has to look at a table of uh, excesses of revenue out over outlays to realise that the government over a period of time, going back to 1983-84, um, can in the broadcasting areas, actually uh, in 1983-84 its uh, revenue was 5.8 times its outlay. But it has risen to 90, in 1989-90 to 9.8 times the, the uh, cost. Now, it's outlay. So here is a taxing uh, process that has been used by government over a period of years to return more and more revenue to itself, a taxing purpose which is a tax but not identified as a tax. And so I believe that uh, the conclusions of uh, the House of Representatives Committee that cost recovery component of the annual charges for spectrum access be levied in such a way that the actual cost incurred by the spectrum manager on behalf of individual users are, de are identified and recovered from individual users and to further assist in developing a transport charging structure, the taxation component contained in charges should be clearly identified. And I think that those are laudable goals. And Minister, we look forward, Secretary, we look forward to the government taking up some of these proposals so that there is a transparency. If you're going to tax people, tell them you're taxing. It's like your wholesale sales tax. Another example where it's built into the cost of running Australia, and particularly for our exporters and our manufacturers, and nobody knows it's there. And that's why next week, when our goods and services tax is released, people will say, well, maybe it's another tax or a different form of tax, but at least we know what it is, and at least we know we've been compensated for anything that we purchase. We will have a reduction in our personal income tax. And that's why you need, as a government, to change the approach that you're adopting in the whole of the broadcast area. Transparency and understanding by the Australian community will build confidence and support for you. I don't know why you run away from it. If you can uh, come out and say, well, this is the cost of running the thing, we're going to recover those costs and we're going to place a, a tax on you as well, that is understandable. But that's not what happens at the moment. And some of this legislation that we're having tonight is about the collection of fees. On what basis are those fees uh, first assessed? We had the, the, uh, the chairman of the caucus committee saying, well, it's crook out there, so we're going to drop fees a bit. That's basically what he was saying. There's the government making an economic assessment of how, how good things are in radio and television and saying, well, because things are crook, we're going to knock back to our licence fees. Now, I don't think that that's altogether a rational approach. Fees are fees for cost recovery, and if there's a tax component, let's identify the tax component. 
Now, there are a number of ways in which we can look at dealing with the system. We go on with the current arrangement of ministry fiddling and, and very expert people involved. And I don't want to discredit them. They're following, in fact, the instructions of government. But life is extremely complicated and rigid in the way in which these things are done. We could fine-tune our, uh, our current system and make it a little bit better. We could introduce a market-based system of some sort where, in fact, those people who want to broadcast actually can take up the portion of the spectrum that they want to use by competing against each other. And earlier this night, tonight, the member for Deakin was in the, in the House, and he, I remember how he was decried years ago when he suggested in this area of high commercial value there should be an auctioning process. Dear, oh dear, what a terrible thing. Headlines nearly brought the opposition into tatters. But uh, it's interesting to notice that one of the recommendations of the House of Representatives Committee, chaired by the Australian Labor Party, dominated by the Australian La Labor Party, has recommended auctions as a system of establishing market value for those areas of high commercial value. And so here we have it, within a period of two or three years, the Australian Labor Party, after denigrating a visionary, a far-sighted man who had said, this is the way we should fix up these systems, the statesman, yes. And, uh, so Julian Bill proposed these things two or three years ago, was bagged from one end of Australia to the other for proposing them, and two or three years later, and so often the case, the, the government picks up these issues that are raised by the opposition and says, what a jolly good idea, how thoughtful, how intellectually sound, how practical and workable, and how, how well it can work for the management of the uh, radio spectrum. And so we have uh, the prospect of a complete market approach right across the spectrum, even the prospect of having community radio and police radio and those people being able to sell parts of the spectrum they have got currently reserved or currently don't use to their own advantage so that others can use it. They collect the revenue from that process to further improve their own services. Or we could have, in fact, a combination of that uh, market approach and an administrative approach, reserving the market system for commercially valuable sectors of the spectrum and using the administrative approach of allocation by the department to those areas where there is community interest concern, there is public uh, merit and good. And so there are the basic choices that Australia has in front of us. I believe that a greater use of the market system must be adopted. Community uh, groups would gain great value from this approach. And so I believe the government must hasten, must hasten, listen to its backbench, listen to those people out there that are desperate to expand the opportunities in this field. This field where Australians for years on a worldwide basis have led in technology, we just need to capitalise on those skills and the government should not be restraining the prospects, the dynamic prospects that changes can bring. That where opportunities for inventiveness, diversity are encouraged, where those who are poorly equipped and cannot uh, devise efficient systems fail, but those who are excellent and popular succeed. What more could Order. we want from our the system than that? The honourable member's time has expired. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. The honourable member for Parramatta. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, at the outset, I'd indicate uh, my support for the measures that are before the House tonight. I listened with interest to the member for Mitchell uh, and his contribution. He actually strayed a, a fair bit away from uh, uh, the provisions in, contained in these particular measures much of the time. But one of the things that he made in his contribution, I note, uh, he certainly indicated at the outset that the opposition was supporting the the measures, as did the member for Bass, uh, but uh, the member for Mitchell did make the comment that the, the process that we were going through in relation to the, the more extensive uh, broadcasting services bill, uh, he was criticising the fact that that was going to take some months to uh, be uh, considered. Well, earlier in the debate, the member for Bass actually commended the government on the, uh, the process uh, of this particular matter and noted the fact that uh, with this bill being tabled as it was uh, last week by the minister and to an hour, allow an extensive period of discussion, that uh, that would give an opportunity for the great range of interest groups uh, covered uh, by the whole range of issues in, in broadcasting uh, policy and operation to have a, 
a chance to have an input into that discussion paper before it comes back uh, to be considered by uh, government in the new year and, and parliament. And I would have thought, uh, and I think the member for Bass even made this comment, that it offered the scope to pr produce a better bill uh, than may have been the case otherwise, and uh, I think that's probably true. I have to say that uh, uh, the bill as it stands goes a long way towards uh, uh, the sort of blueprint for the broadcast uh, policy in this country in a way that I think will serve uh, Australia well. Uh, but there's certainly scope for the, the industry and all the players and the, the great manifestation of players that exist uh, throughout this industry to, to make a contribution to that debate and thereby uh, ensure that uh, what is finally adopted uh, fits well uh, both the respective players and the great range of uh, the Australian populace that is obviously concerned to ensure the measures that are adopted are, are ones that they uh, draw comfort and satisfaction from as well. And the particular measures that are outlined in these uh, bills uh, really start that first process going and recognise the, the, the practical difficulties that uh, particularly regional radio has, and I guess the radio industry as a whole has at, th at this point in time. And, uh, and the government has decided, I think quite rightly, to act in that particular area and to, at the same time, ensure that the measures that are adopted uh, with the passage of this legislation can be uh, blended into the, the Broadcast Services Bill when that comes back to the House next year. And that's important for a number of reasons. Now, it would be easy to say that uh, it's only important because we want to ensure the uh, viability of the, and stability of, of the radio industry. Uh, and that's certainly one of the, the motivations behind uh, the measures, particularly in relation to uh, the uh, reduction in license fee, radio licence fees. But it goes somewhat further than that, and to suggest that all of the uh, difficulties that radio, the radio industry has in Australia today are due to government policy, I think is a very unfair uh, interpretation to place on what has actually happened in that industry. Indeed, if you actually take account of uh, uh, the experience of radio over the last decade, you see very clearly uh, that the, uh, so the auction system, the tendering process that people uh, uh, such as the member for Mitchell sort of alluded to as being uh, appropriate to adopt, uh, you could argue very strongly that that's one of the reasons that much of radio is in the predicament it is today. Uh, and, uh, and certainly uh, if you take the Sydney market as an example, the sort of absurd prices that were paid uh, for radio stations as part of that sort of uh, uh, manic flavour of the month mentality that existed through the 80s as people uh, uh, particularly uh, some notable people sought to get into that industry believing that it was going to be uh, this great new uh, you know, financial windfall and as much of it was driven by not only economic considerations as broader uh, sort of uh, ego considerations and perhaps a whole host of other things that we won't try and uh, enunciate tonight but uh, nevertheless the fact is the industry has uh, gone through that process and uh, almost all of uh, uh, commercial radio faces the, the predicament that uh, uh, it has uh, certainly falling revenue because of the economic uh, uh, downturn, but uh, just as significantly the sort of debt servicing that people have had to uh, go through and the problems of people exiting the industry uh, because of uh, you know, financial uh, uh, failure and so forth ha ha does mean that the government, I think, is right to, to seek to act uh, in those uh, areas at this time. Now, as well as that, the, the member for Mitchell referred to uh, the questions relating to the, the radio frequency spectrum. And that certainly is a, an interesting area. There's no doubt uh, that uh, there's, uh, the committee report uh, that the House committee uh, has brought forward on that issue does uh, open up a lot of exciting opportunities in that area. And it's fair to say that uh, uh, whilst it's an incredibly complex matter to try and debate and to articulate in any sort of uh, logical fashion in a debate in, in the House, uh, it, opera it does uh, give uh, very exciting opportunities for Australia, and we know that Australians generally have a great thirst for technology and are, are willing to take advantage of that. And in fact, these bills recognise that in a number of ways, because what we're actually saying is that there's scope for, for new players, more players, and uh, uh, to the, the development of niche marketing in, in radio that perhaps hasn't been fully appreciated in the past because of a fairly fixed sort of structure that we've had operate, Mr Deputy Speaker. And, uh, and so I believe that the the measures that we're dealing with tonight uh, represent an important uh, part of that uh, restructure that's going on, and the, the broadcasting services bill that we'll deal with next year uh, really goes uh, very much further in that process, and uh, I've no doubt 
uh, that the opportunities and the, the flexibility that the member for Mitchell sought in his contribution tonight in this area are well and truly catered for in the various provisions in the, in the two uh, parcels of legislation that the, the House will consider over this period of time. So I say so on that point particularly that uh, I think the period of discussion and debate is a worthwhile one because one of the things you learn as soon as you start to look at these areas at all is the changes in technology are so rapid and uh, just uh, almost uh, beyond uh, belief just for someone who doesn't have any uh, particular understanding of the technology, just how rapid those changes are, that uh, uh, a period of deba debate won't be unhelpful. It will be far from it. It will very much help in uh, helping to get the, the environment right, the setting right, and so that uh, those that then seek to participate in, uh, in radio, be it in regional areas or uh, broader community interests, will be able to do so. And that, uh, of course, raises the, the, the other points about uh, what, uh, what do we seek to do with these measures that are before the House tonight, and uh, in particular when we look at the question relating to licence fees. Now, I certainly had many representations over a period of time from uh, radio uh, operators that uh, have expressed great concern, and the, as the member for uh, Burke outlined earlier, the Broadcasting Working Group has had a lot of uh, uh, people put to us the difficulties experienced by people in, uh, in regional radio because of the, the limitations and the, uh, the time delays that have occurred in, in dealing with those processes. So I will talk uh, about those in, uh, in some length. But just looking at the fee structure, first of all, this, uh, the bills that we're dealing with uh, ensure that, uh, that the levels that were set in 1988 are as, they, as I've said, which reflected a very speculative sort of valuations for, on FM channels rather than sustainable commercial values. And with that experience, I think we're able to say uh, that uh, it's, uh, it's reasonable to have a reassessment of that process, process now. It, uh, and it, the current fee structure uh, has uh, also had the failing of, uh, in, insofar as it could not uh, be applied to FM allocations, other than new independent services and conversions where a new FM service entered the market and its progressive scale relied upon brackets which could not uh, produce uh, inequities at the bracket margins and uh, also to ensure that the sort of uh, bracket creep approach that th that applied uh, was built into the system. Now, the new access fee arrangement recognises, uh, I think, a more efficient way of uh, enabling particularly new players to, to come into the, the radio industry, and I think it will be a more equitable means of uh, encouraging that access and certainly uh, in terms of the competitive environment as we get more players in, in ra the radio industry well it lends itself uh, very much to uh, uh, that sort of approach so the calculation of the FM access fee takes into account the number of commercial radio services operated in a given service area and the relevant average gross earnings for these services so I think uh, the member for Mitchell suggested that to take account of those sort of economic considerations, uh, was something that you know, should be left out of it. And, uh, but uh, I think the experience has shown that this uh, type of approach, uh, particularly for radio, particularly for this uh, uh, current climate of, of the radio industry, and particularly because of the new opportunities that do exist for people uh, to get into the, the radio industry, uh, uh, are able to be fully taken advantage of. It is clear uh, when uh, one looks at the media uh, issues generally that uh, the opportunity people will have to uh, uh, run radio stations as time goes on is going to uh, uh, be very considerable indeed with, uh, uh, with technology developing as it is. And the old uh, times where someone would be more likely to set up a, a small uh, newspaper or the like, uh, or uh, uh, they'd seek uh, uh, to develop other sorts of media interests, I think will give, right, give way as time goes on to the technology uh, that uh, uh, that radio and certainly things like uh, uh, optic fibre and other things offer as, uh, as the years go on. And when a number of speakers are referred to the development of, of cable TV, and even in that area, if you try to take a 10-year spectrum on what's going to happen in terms of uh, pay television, uh, you'd be very brave indeed to be able to assert that uh, any one particular mode of, uh, of pay television is going to apply right through that uh, decade. Clearly that's not going to be the case. The changes that will occur in technology uh, will be immense uh, again in that field. So uh, in looking at uh, trying to establish a framework, what we've said in this particular uh, package of bills that are here tonight, we recognise there are particular 
uh, difficulties that are faced by the radio industry, uh, particularly, as I said, the regional radio, radio operators. We've acknowledged that in some cases where uh, there is a, a limited opportunity for people to participate, that the public uh, broadcasters who uh, often have, as the member for Bass, I think, pointed out, haven't had their uh, services fully appreciated, uh, particularly in ethnic broadcasters, as was one I think he mentioned. And that's certainly true. And there's been a number of very positive and encouraging things actually achieved in that area. And uh, the changes that uh, are outlined here certainly, I think, uh, facilitate much of that process. So, as I said, the combinations of uh, measures that a combination of the measures contained here uh, give the scope for the radio industry to uh, uh, be more uh, commercially viable and vital. It also ensures that the tribunal's role, uh, which uh, has uh, had a tendency in these areas to get uh, somewhat uh, uh, bogged down and be made unduly complex from what their real charter should be in this particular area, that they'll be able to certainly streamline their uh, con concerns in this regard. They'll be able to have uh, more effective regard to public interest criteria. And the sort of debate that goes on uh, between competition and efficiency, I think, is more adequately reflected in the, uh, in the bill that uh, we have before us. And the tribunal, in taking account of the changes in the law in that area, should be able to ensure that the, the whole process, the administrative pr process for the granting of licences, is one that they're able to carry out more efficiently and effectively. And in terms of delays that people were, talk were talking about, the member Mitchell talked about earlier in the debate, clearly. Uh, what we have achieved uh, with the passage of this particular bill gives the tribunal much more scope uh, to deal with applications for the granting of licences in this particular field uh, much more efficiently than would have been the case in the past. And one hopes uh, the, the uh, streamlining of that process uh, will lead to uh, those participants uh, being able to more readily to get involved. Now, there are other provisions in the bill relating to uh, the supplementary licence uh, set up, and that was something that certainly been put uh, uh, to the broadcasting working group. The difficulties that the existing law has uh, created in that area, and uh, uh, this particular bill uh, goes some way towards that. And there are other recommendations that are contained in the broadcasting services bill, which will uh, again fundamentally influence that process. And I think again the the combination of those measures. Uh, go a long way towards meeting the concerns that have been expressed in that particular field. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, as I say, I think these uh, uh, bills that we have before us tonight are very positive. They will be very important, I think, for much of uh, the regional, uh, many regional areas of Australia. Uh, they will particularly be beneficial, I think, in providing the, the certainty that the industry has been seeking. Uh, and uh, it uh, is all very well to say, well, that's all caused because of uh, this problem or that problem. Uh, what the industry was fundamentally saying in the lobbying uh, uh, that they had done in the past about it was uh, they've got a particular predicament. They would like to see uh, the government enunciate its policy clearly in this area. Uh, they didn't believe uh, that uh, these measures uh, should be ones that uh, wait until all the other uh, consequential matters of the Broadcasting Services Bill are fully uh, uh, developed, and I think they were right in, uh, in seeking that, and the government and the minister, I think, has acted very appropriately to bring forward these particular bills, because they will have the effect of uh, hopefully ensuring that the, the great competitive environment that uh, can and will develop uh, in, in radio is facilitated by this process, and certainly the commercial viability question, which uh, is an important process in uh, in this uh, exercise is uh, hastened, and the tribunal's role, which again, I, as I said, should facilitate uh, efficient uh, consideration of licence uh, uh, requests in this area, will be able to be uh, uh, more readily undertaken as well. So, for those reasons, I think they are a very positive step for our broadcasting policy generally, and, uh, and particularly when you consider this together with the blueprint for the industry that is outlined in the Broadcasting Services Bill that the community at large is going to have great opportunity to debate. And uh, that certainly all the people that uh, I've heard uh, discuss this issue are very happy to have that opportunity to have an input into the deliberation of that bill, because, uh, because it will mean that the final product uh, that's developed, as occurred in uh, telecommunications, will be one that the whole industry can feel they've actually had a a clear input into, and I think if it's fair to say, if the minister had just have come along without a proper uh, process like that and introduced this bill, and the parliament was asked to uh, adopt it without uh, proper consideration, well, the, the consequential effects of that uh, would have been uh, most unfortunate for the 
for the parliament, uh, certainly, but more importantly for the people of Australia, because it wouldn't have ensured that the whole range of interest groups that are out there concerned about uh, broadcasting policy uh, and our, our media interests generally are able to contribute, and many of them have great expertise, as we've found not only in the Standing Committee on Transport and Communications, but even in more recent times in the print media inquiry, we've found a lot of people there that have had a lot of expertise and certainly are prepared to put their views quite forcefully on occasions. So with those uh, few words, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm pleased to support the bills uh, before us, and I trust the parliament will give them uh, a strong endorsement. Thank you. The question is, as this will be now read a second time, the honourable member for Maranoa. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The, bill, the bills debated in Cognate tonight include the Broadcasting Amendment Bill, the Radio Licence Fees Amendment Bill and the Television Licence Fees Amendment Bill. And what uh, attracted my attention to these bills was a provision to enable new FM, commercial and supplementary radio, radio services to become available and re to regional listeners more quickly under a regional radio program. Mr Speaker, I hope such measures have a greater success rate and are advanced far more quickly, far more significant pace, I should say, than the government-initiated aggregation process. The phrase coined in rural Queensland, and I imagine in many parts of rural Australia, is not uh, aggregation but it is television aggravation. The government has boasted and persists in boasting that aggregation gives regional viewers the same standard of television services as urban viewers. In fact, Mr Speaker, aggregation has left many rural communities far worse off. They should come out in the bush and have a look sometimes. I wish they would. As the member for Park said, I wish they'd come out and have a look in the bush sometimes. I recognise that these communities are in a minority. However, I do not believe as taxpaying residents they have any less rights. The situation is illustrated in the provision of ABC services is a clear example of the denial of such rights. Some towns are provided with the service with no associated costs, while others must install retransmission facilities at their own cost. The Baku Shire Council in my electorate and the far west of my electorate provides a good example. While townships south, north, east and west of the Shire are provided with ABC free of charge, the towns of Stonehenge, Windor and Junda, towns in the Baku Shire, are not. The Shire's commercial television service is also paid for by the residents. This situation does nothing to encourage decentralisation. A television service certainly assists in attracting and holding a more contented workforce in remote areas of Australia. Now, in 1985, the Baku Shire Council spent $61,722 on the provision of an ABC, ABC television rebroadcasting system. This money was spent on a service that is taken, taken for granted and provided, mind you, provided free of charge to the majority of Australians. Consider the ABC's recent advertising slogan, slogan the service costs only eight cents per day. Mr Deputy Speaker, the residents of the Barku Shire would certainly begrudge one cent more of their income tax going to the provision of ABC services across the country, let alone eight cents a day. Their eight cents a day goes towards the service. They already pay $4,200 in ongoing costs and $6,000 in associated costs every year. Now, in 1988, $38,994 was spent in providing additional equipment for rebroadcast of commercial television. Now, the, the Baku Shire Council is not an isolated example. And I imagine, and I'm sure, that in the, in the uh, electorate of Kennedy, which borders on Maranao, there will be many towns and shires who suffer the same problem. And right across the large electorates and rural electorates and the member for parks, I'm sure in your electorate you would have uh, communities and shire councils who are funding their own uh, commercial television. 
Uh, absolutely. Since, since aggr aggregation, which we know uh, many people out there calling aggravation, as the member for Lyons says, ABC operates on a uh, paid TV basis in the towns of Eulo and Wyandra, along with the many more small towns throughout my electorate. Now, when the debate for paid television starts in the community, let me, and the urban community start to debate pay television, let me tell the House that we already have pay television out there in rural Australia. So I, I don't think there'll be a great debate from rural Australia whether we should or should not. We've already got pay television. And the member for Bass, he was, uh, I was very fortunate to have the member for Bass. We made a visit to my electorate uh, earlier this year. And I know he understands the situation out there because we, we went to the towns of Taroom where we saw firsthand the cost that they are associated with uh, providing television for the community in the Tarim Shire Council. It's very, very pleasing to hear. And, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'd seek leave to table a, uh, a document here tonight which uh, outlines the cost of providing television by local councils in the electorate of Maranao. And you can see quite clearly from this document that. Uh, I've outlined six shires which have spent in capital outlays up to $366,000 providing this uh, television. They've got annual running costs of $45,700 in continuing to provide this service to the residents of their community. Now, I'd seek leave if I could uh, table a document. Yeah, is, is leave granted? Yeah, leave is granted. I thank the, uh, the uh, parliamentary secretary to the minister for. Uh, allowing me to table that uh, document. Mr Speaker, the acting speaker, I should say, the cost of providing a service that towns with a population of more than 1,000 get free represents thousands and thousands of dollars, as that document will confirm. This ongoing cost is met by local ratepayers and is a heavy burden on very small towns. Also, what must be taken into consideration is the annual operating costs and associated costs of providing an ABC service to residents disadvantaged, quite clearly disadvantaged by location. There are many examples of services offered to cities and suburbs that are threatened or, or not in existence in rural areas. ABC television, childcare facilities, post office agencies and the overall high cost of living provide a deterrent to living in the more remote areas of Australia. This situation reflects poorly the fact that 80 per cent of all Australia's export income comes from the rural and remote areas of Australia, and I refer to the farm and those many mines located in rural and remote Australia. And I'd ask the, minister, the, uh, the, the uh, parliamentary secretary to the minister to look at that problem, if he would, and address it. To, I'd hope he would address it uh, in his summing up tonight. Let me now to turn to aggregation and the provision of commercial television to remote Queensland. I have lodged petitions on behalf of concerned residents of the electorate. I've written to the Broadcasting Tribunal. I've written to the relevant minister, all to very little avail. Many communities and properties receive poor, co commercial, sorry, receive poor commercial television reception or, as the member for Lyons said earlier, no commercial television where previously the, uh, the uh, reception was unhindered. A town in the east of my electorate, the town of Texas, is set at the foot of the large hill known as the Beacon. Since aggregation and the conversion to UHF as opposed to the VHF signal they used to receive, commercial television reception is very poor, if in fact they can get it. A reasonable reception can only be received by installation of a high-cost UHF antenna costing anywhere in excess of $500 for each and every resident of the town, where prior to that they had a small antenna for $50 and they could receive the VHF signal. People unable to afford this cost as a result of aggregation now only receive the ABC, which is still on the uh, VHF signal. The situation upriver at Riverton also is considerably worse, with properties unable to get a picture from the high-cost antennas because of the rugged terrain. Previously, VHF transmission 
did allow a reasonable reception, but all this has changed under aggregation. Well, obviously, because they haven't uh, addressed it, and, uh, and as I said, I've written to the relevant minister, I've written to the Australian Broadcasting Tribunal, to little avail. The situation is still as it was months ago. The resident's only option in these areas is a $1,500 individual satellite dish. Once again, pay television. Interference has also become a major problem as these signal strengths have changed from VHF and, in some cases, to UHF. Interference is a major problem in the Bohemia Shah in the north of my electorate. Aggregation there will not be completed in the Shah until December of 92. Now, until such times, time, residents will receive the ABC and a substandard commercial television reception. The community is appealing for the aggregation process in that area to be speeded up. Residents feel that they are being treated as second-rate citizens. Deputy Speaker, commercial television, regardless of aggregation, is not extended to many parts of my electorate. Many communities must fund their own retransmission facilities to receive commercial, commercial television and, in some cases, to receive any television at all. My initial cost analysis gives the capital outlay of providing television by local councils in my electorate to be in excess of $350,000. The annual cost of providing such a service is approaching $46,000 and the associated cost, annual costs in the vicinity of $20,000. Mr Speaker, I greet the news of hastening the pace of providing FM radio service radio services to regional listeners with due scepticism. I know the preference of many within the electorate would be to sort out the aggregation aggravation mess before proceeding with another venture. I appeal to the government to address the inequity in providing ABC television services across the country. I fur further appeal to the uh, appeal that current difficulties faced by many rural communities resulting from aggregation be addressed as a matter of urgency. There's one other subject I'd like to touch on before <coughs> closing, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and that was the, the proposed, uh, well, the funding cuts that were um, initiated as out of necessity earlier this year to the ABC. And one of the programs that was uh, feared very much by rural Australians was that the country hour may be subjected to uh, funding cuts. And the real fear there was uh, perhaps the state segments would be, would be cut as a result of funding cuts. Now, I'm very happy to say that that didn't happen, and I'm sure that um, it was because of the representation of many members around Australia. But let me say to the House tonight that, it is that the country hour is a part of everyday life in rural Australia. It's very important to people living in rural Australia. And the services that ABC Country Hour supplies, they bring up, they bring, uh, up to the minute market information. It's a vital service. And I'd have to commend the uh, government on continuing funding for that uh, ABC Country Hour. Because where it supplies that service, and, the, the most, uh, and perhaps in many rem remote areas, there are no daily papers sitting on the doorstep every morning. And you'd be surprised where you hear people listening to the country hour. You've only got to go down to the shearing shed someday and you'll find the shearers are listening to it. It's not only the people on the properties, it's the whole community. It's part of everyday life. It's part of the Bible to people uh, living in rural Australia. And I must say that uh, if any uh, cuts to funding are to the ABC, they should not be to the country hour because it is a vital service to rural Australia. And I'd just like to close by paying a tribute to the staff of many uh, of the ABC because they do uh, bring a service on ABC radio, uh, a vital service, particularly at times of floods when the only link, the only communication link is by that radio service. Because many of these uh, ABC broadcasters, they're up before the majority of Australians are out of bed. They're getting the information, they're looking at the weather for the day, and uh, they provide an invaluable service. And I would like to pay tribute tonight to uh, 
a broadcaster who'd given in excess of 25 years service to the ABC in Queensland. And that's Adrian Scott, based in Toowoomba. He's a legend in his own time, and I believe that uh, he does deserve recognition, as he has. Uh, it was an, uh, an Australia Day Award uh, two years ago. Yeah. But um, it is people like that in the ABC that make life a little more bearable in rural Australia, and I think that we should all commend the work of the ABC rural broadcasters. The question is, this woman now read a second time, the Honourable Member for Parks. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and may I say it's a privilege to follow on from the member for Maranoa, who spoke from the heart about uh, the need for uh, proper television and broadcasting services in country areas. And I would like to endorse his comments, uh, support them, that the, uh, the government continue the funding of the country hour, which is listened to by a wide country audience. If cutbacks are to take place, I suggest they might have a look at some of the uh, radical feminist programs they seem to run at night on the, uh, on the ABC radio that I hear as I drive along from one function to another. Or perhaps programs on television like The Big Gig, full, full of uh, cheap undergraduate humour. I can't see much cultural significance to it or appeal to the great mass of Australians. Uh, the Country Hour is a very essential program. It gives people the wool and uh, wheat prices. Uh, uh, the latest prices for, for horticulture, the daily market prices, as the member for Maranoa says, and provides a great service. And uh, that would be the that would be the last uh, program I'd be thinking of cutting back. The matters I want to uh, uh, speak about tonight uh, relate to uh, what the minister calls a minor amendment in this bill, uh, relating to public radio stations and their ability to uh, to run advertisements. And I welcome uh, the addition of this amendment in the bill. I spoke on it uh, initially just over two years ago now, and I'm delighted to see the minister has first taken it up. Essentially, it allows public radio stations where there is no overlapping commercial radio station broadcasting into the same area to be able to broadcast sponsorship announcements which promote products and services. The situation up until now has been they can only run uh, sponsorship ads, as they call them, and these have only been able to mention the sponsor's name and telephone number once. And of course, it's very hard to get people <coughs> to kick in money to run these uh, type of ads and in inverted commas uh, when they can't uh, have their product described properly over the airwaves. Uh, the Western Area Broadcasting uh, uh, in Burke, in my electorate, which goes under the call sign 2WEB needs this type of sponsorship so that they can generate uh, the income necessary to run their station. I understand that this uh, particular amendment will only cover about five radio stations in Australia. Uh, there's one in Victoria, a couple in South Australia and uh, one in Western Australia as, as well as the uh, 2WEB uh, radio station at Burke. There's something like 110 uh, public broadcasting stations now operating right across Australia. Uh, Public broadcasting has been in existence since 1972. Uh, they're independent, they're non-profit and they're non-commercial. Sponsorship for these type of stations uh, usually pays for about 25% of, uh, of their budget and the rest comes from the government and some fundraising activities which they may engage in. But with 2WEB at Burke, uh, something like 50 to 60% of their income uh, uh, to total budget of $400,000 a year comes from sponsorship, and it's very vital to them. Uh, that particular radio station has 12 people on the staff, and it is a big employer in Burke, including Dave Kesby, who, who, who does a wonderful job uh, broadcasting into the electorate of Maranoa and my electorate of Parks. Uh, this radio station pays out about $220,000 in wages each year, and on their staff they have three Aboriginal trainees. Uh, which are sponsored by DEET, and uh, the, that radio station hopes to put at least one or more of those on in a permanent position at the end of their training. I might add that the only government help they get uh, is uh, through that DEET uh, uh, funding, as well as some uh, government advertising that's run, for example, with health uh, promotion programs, uh, plugging anti-smoking or anti-drinking programs, or if uh, the RTA wants to plug uh, how people should be wearing helmets, that sort of thing. The radio station otherwise is uh, largely self-supporting. 
Their advertising, as I say, makes up 50 to 60 per cent of their budget, and that mainly comes from uh, small business and local community groups. They raise the rest of their money through such things as uh, uh, selling uh, T-shirts, uh, selling mugs, uh, selling stickers, selling records. Uh, uh, in previous years, they've run concerts, they've run outside broadcasts, and last year they had a radiothon which raised over $50,000 to keep the station on air. If, uh, if they can't raise this money themselves, the alternatives are they would close down, which of course is unthinkable, tragedy. or they would uh, a tragedy indeed, or they would have to call on the government to kick in some money to keep them open, and that is not something they would want to do, nor the government would want to do, I would imagine. Uh, two WEB operate out of a fairly new building up there, which cost $300,000, two-thirds of which was raised privately. They've got a $75,000 5-kilowatt uh, transmitter and broadcast on frequency uh, 585. The area they broadcast into is at least uh, 60,000 square kilometres in size, an area the size of, uh, of Tasmania. When you think of it, uh, I guess people who live in Sydney and Melbourne uh, don't contemplate uh, don't uh, the size. <coughs> exactly, they they reach about 40 to 50,000 people, and 80 per cent, 80 per cent of that audience listens to 2WEB. Uh, you pick up the uh, you pick up the uh, main newspapers in Sydney, and you see radios there are struggling to get 10, 15, 20 per cent of the audience, but here they they have 80 per cent of the audience. And the reason they do that is, is because they're the only station that put on uh, local news. Uh, they also broadcast rural news that's particular to that area. They put on uh, Aboriginal programs for that area, as well as educational community programs. And these type of thing, uh, programs unite the people of, er of, uh, of that area. It gives them a quality of life. And uh, as the member for Maranoa was, was saying in, in his uh, speech, it, uh, it uh, provides a quality of life such that you can at attract uh, bank managers into the area, teachers and people like this. In, uh, in, in my town, of, uh, a town in my electorate uh, called Bawarana, they've just had their uh, pharmacy closed down. Uh, the government actually bought them out under this ridiculous program, which, which, which means that uh, another pharmacy can't start, start up for another four years, even though there is another fellow now that wants to. So that town doesn't have a pharmacy. But to, to attract people like that, you've got to have these little things like a, like, like, a, yeah, like, like a swimming pool or, uh, uh, or uh, uh, t proper television programs or proper radio programs. And, th and this is so necessary to have for the area. The nearest commercial station uh, uh, the broadcast to Burke would be uh, 2DU at Dubbo, some 400 kilometres away, half a day's drive, if you can do the drive without uh, exceeding the speed limit. But TWE broadcasts into towns apart from Burke and Bawarana, which I've also uh, already mentioned, into towns like Byrock, Coolabar, Girolambone, Louth, Tilpa, Ingonia, Barangun, Fords Bridge, Yantabulla, Hungerford, Wanaring. Will Maringle, Gaduga, Lightning Ridge, and Walgut. They do have uh, a translator station, ABC station, that relays in there from Sydney and sometimes from Orange, but it has very little or no local content at all. So subsequently, while it's appreciated, very few people listen to it compared with uh, com compared with 2WEB. The only quibble I've got with, uh, with this amendment, uh, which is contained under clause 18 in the bill, is that uh, the sponsorship announcements uh, will be restricted to four minutes each hour. Now, I don't know quite why the minister has included that uh, unduly restriction into the bill. I thought uh, something like six minutes would have been much more reasonable. And I see little purpose to restricting uh, to restricting it for four minutes. I can see, obviously, uh, you wouldn't want ten or fifteen minutes because it would end up like a another commercial station. But I put it to the minister that four minutes is perhaps a little unduly restrictive. So, with those comments, I, I compliment that amendment. I, it will be very welcome in the area, and uh, it is with some considerable pleasure that uh, I support the bill. Hey. The question is, this will be now read a second time. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you. Uh, 
Mr Deputy Speaker, look, it gives me uh, great pleasure to be able to uh, finish off this debate, so to speak. <laughs> I uh, what, want to thank all the honourable members for their contributions. Uh, what it's demonstrated to me is that there's a great depth of knowledge and a great deal of interest on both sides of the chamber in this particular subject. And I think uh, all members are to be commended for that interest. I think it also demonstrates that uh, in an area where uh, there is a great deal of change, that we can get uh, agreement on that change, and I feel confident that uh, the legislation which has been the exposure draft of the broadcasting services legislation, which uh, uh, a number of members referred to tonight, will, uh, will be uh, used wisely by people. And I think that the consultative mechanisms which have been put into play will be ones which uh, all members of the House will see a great deal of merit in. And I know that uh, we will get out of that uh, a, a number of changes to broadcasting in this country which will be supported throughout the community. I don't want to uh, address any, of the, any issues in particular, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm pleased that uh, all opposition members were able to support, well, all the opposition members were able to support, support the uh, legislation. I was going to talk about uh, 2WEB, but I've decided that the member for for Parks did such a fine job that there's no need for me to contribute. In, in respect to the member for Maranoa, he made a number of very fine points about the, uh, the uh, difficulties which face people who live in remote areas. I might remind him I have uh, uh, similar difficulties with, with uh, areas in my electorate, and uh, I'm sure he understands the implications of that. Mr Deputy Speaker, it gives me pleasure now to move that this bill be now read a third time. Not yet? Tomorrow? The question is that this bill be narrowed a second. Oh, second time. Do you have a point of order, Member for Lyon? I would like to say a few words. <laughs> well, I, I, I think it's uh, possible after the secretary responds. Um, it's a matter for Madam Deputy. Member for Lyon. Can I proceed? Yes, you Thank have you the call. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. I won't keep the house very long, but. Uh, it has surprised me tonight because I thought that I was the only person in the uh, chamber that uh, represented an electorate where people could not receive television. Only a portion of my electorate, and uh, after the speeches tonight by the member for Maranoa and the member for Parks, I appreciate the fact that there are other parts of Australia that are having a problem. Uh, I did raise it here in the House a week or so ago, but I would like to emphasise that I have many constituents in the Gloucestershire district and in the Greater Taree City Council area that previously could always receive Prime and the ABC. Now there has been what is termed to be an upgrading from the VHF to the UHF on an area known as the Middle Brother Mountain area. And all of this is involved with, with the aggregation that is now, of course, in the pipeline. I was extremely disappointed to find out, you know, particularly in view of the statements that had been made by the ABC and by the Minister for Telecommunications over the fact that they were making available TV to all the people of Australia. And to find out that there are areas now, besides my own electorate of Lyme, that areas in the Dubbo, the Queensland, the Maranoa, I believe in the Wide Bay area too. Kennedy. Where, where Kennedy electorate, areas that had previously received it. And uh, I have received, Madam Deputy Speaker, many letters indeed. I have written to the Minister for Telecommunications about this, and he has had a reply given to me that certainly does not satisfy the people concerned, because they can't work out that if that service was there, why the service should not be there, yet the equipment is being updated to service them and to give them improved viewing from actually before. Some of those who were getting Prime TV uh, are not receiving it now. And uh, I was pleased to see, in a way, that uh, so many of the people out on the farms in the country area depend upon watching the ABC TV. And the radio was... Uh, spoken about this evening, the country are by the member, members for Parks and for Maranoa. And these people rely upon it. 
They love to watch not only the news on the ABC, but uh, also the, th the 730 report and a lot of the sensible music and the viewing that you see there without the ads, I might happen to say. And uh, that is part of their life today. And, you know, people have uh, written to me, even a Dr John Taylor in the Forbesdale area, in the Gloucester district, who speaks on behalf of uh, many of the people within the community. These are old grazier families, Madam Deputy Speaker, and uh, they can't work out why it is in this modern world. Of course, they're told that uh, after the mechanic goes out and has a look, well, there's no problem here. We're going to boost it a little at Christmas time and you may happen to receive it. Now admittedly this is in a fairly mountainous kind of an area. Some of the area concerned but not all are on the flats even. But they're told, well righto, if you would like to buy a dish at a cost of about $4,000 you will receive an improved service. Well certainly so, as referred to tonight by the member for Maranoa, that is basically paid television. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, I take this matter very seriously. I do, because I lived in the country myself. I'm out in the country now. You love to be home sometime to watch the television. And the point about it is that, look, if Australians are to receive better viewing, well, it's time that we received it with the technical knowledge that is available today to telecommunications. I wrote to the chairman of the ABC the other day, and uh, I appealed I appeal to him, Mr David Hill. Well, he comes here yearly and he interviews the party and he, at least he gives to us the opportunity of speaking with him and to question him. And he always says to us, look, if any of you have a problem, please contact me. So I decided to write to him. And only a day or so before I wrote the letter, Madam Deputy Speaker, we had the telecom people here who were telling us about the wonderful service, the profits, the way that they are catering for people right throughout Australia. And I explained to them very quickly the fact about my constituents who were not able to get their viewing reception. They said, well, look, we're working. We're working under the direction of the ABC. But they're still the ones with the technical knowledge that must advise the ABC. Now, my question is, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I don't know whether the Minister of the Table Secretary of the Table can answer this. I don't expect him to. My question is, who is responsible? If the ABC are finding the money and if telecom, telecommunications are actually providing the service with the technical knowledge, surely somebody can work it out. So I just wanted to rise tonight because I'm very concerned about it. I just appeal to the government, I appeal to the minister, I appeal to the ABC, for goodness sake, if there's been a mistake made, Try to remedy the mistake because there are so many people that have got a confidence in TV and the radio today and in the country areas, they are very, very dependent on it. Yeah. Question is that the Broadcasting Amendment Bill No. 2, 1991, be read a second time. All those who have that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark? Second reading, a bill for an act to amend the Broadcasting Act 1942 and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the House to, oh, to proceed to the third reading for with? No objection is so ordered. Call the Parliamentary Secretary. This bill be narrowed a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. All those who have that opinion say aye. If the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Bar. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the Broadcasting Act 1942 and for related purposes. Order of the day number seven, Radio Licence Fees Amendment Bill, resumption of debate on the second reading. The question is that the bill be read a second time. All those who have that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark? Second reading, a bill for an act to amend the Radio Licence Fees Act 1964 and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the House to proceed to the third reading forthwith? No objection is so ordered. Um, Parliamentary Secretary. I move this bill be narrowed a third time. The question is the bill be read a third time. All those that are of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Mr. Clark. Third, re <coughs> third reading, a bill for an act to amend the Radio Licence Fees Act 1964 and for related purposes. Order of the day number eight, Television Licence Fees Amendment Bill, resumption of debate on the second reading. The question is that the bill be read a second time. All those that are of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Second reading, a bill for an act to amend the Television Licence Fees Act 1964. 
Is it the wish of the House to proceed to the third reading forthwith? There being no objection, is so ordered. Call the Parliamentary Secretary. I move that the bill be narrowed a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. All those who have that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have. Mr. Clark. Third reading: A bill for an act to amend the Television Licence Fees Act, 1964. Order. The following message from the Senate has been received. The Senate returns to the House of Representatives the bill for an act to amend the law relating to transport and communications and for related purposes, and acquaints the House that the Senate has agreed to the bill with the amendments indicated in, by the annex schedule, in which amendments the Senate requests the concurrence of the House of Representatives. Call the Parliamentary Secretary. I move that the amendments be taken into consideration in committee of the whole House forthwith. Uh, all those that have that opinion say aye. As a contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Chairman. Just call the parliamentary secretary. The parliamentary secretary. Thank you, Mr. Scott. I move the amendments be agreed to. Um, the transport and communications, where these amendments deal with the, the transport and communications legislation amendment bill 1991. The Senate made five amendments to the transport and communications legis legislation amendment bill. The First Amendment inserts a new part which provides for the merger of a wholly owned subsidiaries of Telecom and OTC to be tax neutral, no, tax neutral in effect. An example of such a merger could be in the case of Telecom International and OTC International. The Second Amendment includes a new amendment to the Civil Aviation Act 1988 to give the Civil Aviation Authority power to investigate cases of damage to property caused by wake vortices. The amendment will also enable the CAA to make arrangements for compensation for people affected. The Third Amendment makes a minor change to an offence provision in the Civil Aviation Act. The amendment inserts the words knowingly or recklessly in a provision creating an offence for operating an aircraft without an airworthiness certificate. The amendment is not strictly necessary as the offence was not one of strict liability. However, the government is prepared to accept this amendment. The Fourth Amendment omits a part of the bill which amends the Parliamentary Procedures Broadcasting Act. This change has been made following concerns raised that the amendments would remove the opportunity for civil action for defamation against television broadcasters of parliamentary proceedings where the broadcasting amounts to unfair and inaccurate reporting. The Fifth Amendment inserts a new part of the bill containing amendments to the Telecommunications Act. Act. That part contains amendments which will reduce the period that the parliament has to disallow delegated legislation under the Telecommunications Act from 15 sitting days to five for instruments tabled in the period from 14 November to 31 December 1991. This reduction will give the new second telecommunications carrier certainty about the rules that will govern its operation before it purchases OSAT. Other amendments in the part will make it clear that a carrier has a right to have telecommunications services supplied to it by another carrier when it makes a reasonable request for the supply of those services. The new part also contains a minor technical change to the, to the uh, tariffing requirements, section 194 of the Telecommunications Act. The government accepts, the, accepts these amendments which have been made by the Senate. The question is the amendments be agreed to. The uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. These amendments are um, quite significant in what they do, and I think uh, some remarks uh, about them, in addition to those of the Secretary, need to be made. I indicate, obviously, uh, as they've come from the Senate, uh, that the Coalition supports them and we supported them in the Senate, and so they'll pass through here with the concurrence of this House tonight. There are a couple of matters that I wanted to uh, raise. The first one was regard to uh, the changes to the uh, Australian uh, Overseas and Telecommunications Corporation Act, and that relates to uh, the concept of merger and the tax consequences that flow to subsidiaries of the uh, principal uh, bodies that are being merged. And uh, the example is given of uh, by the Secretary of Telecom uh, Australia International and OTC International. It's envisaged um, that they will be uh, merged into uh, the new entity. Um, of course, that remains to be seen. And uh, quite clearly, uh, it's a matter for the new board, which is yet to be uh, announced. I understand that uh, a decision on the uh, board is imminent, and uh, that's the board of the new amalgamated uh, body, that's Telecom and OTC, which will be the largest uh, country uh, uh, company in Australia. Uh, but that'll be a matter for the board, and it's quite possible that those two entities may uh, stay as uh, subsidiaries but uh, the tax consequences, as I read this amendment, are to be neutralised so that in the event that they are merged, there is not an ongoing tax uh, liability. 
That is uh, quite important, and uh, as I said, it remains to be seen whether or not those two entities will in fact be merged. Indeed, one of the underpinning principles that the uh, government put forward for the uh, benefits of this merger was that the international arms would be uh, able to generate uh, significant income for Australia. One would hope that that is the case, but if one has a look at their uh, broken down accounts, apparently um, that is yet to be realised. But in any event, uh, that uh, is a significant amendment. The other significant uh, point uh, is that the, the bill also amends the Telecommunications uh, Act and places in the Act a, a broader test of reasonableness in the event that the second carrier who applies to uh, the principal carrier, that is Telecom, the second carrier is yet to be announced, where they make a request for a right to interconnect its facilities to the network of another, then that carrier also has a right to have telecommunications services supplied to it by another when it makes a reasonable request. And part of the necessity to uh, put this uh, broader test of reasonableness, which will be arbitrated by Austel, the telecommunications uh, authority, that is to oversee the emerging greater competitive uh, telecommunications services that this whole proposal uh, envisages. Where telecom will not entertain a request, uh, then uh, they, of course, could stymie the development uh, of the second carrier's network, and that would not be reasonable. So this additional amendment has been required. And as it facilitates uh, the uh, growth for the second carrier and entry into that market, we, of course, would support it. But it's quite clear that uh, when you ask telecom to enter into a competitive arrangement, and that's what the legislation does. You've got to expect that they're going to uh, act, and you would hope that they would act competitively. And uh, already they are showing uh, uh, that they are interpreting the telecommunications bill in a very strict way, and that is why, uh, in a very narrow way, that is why this additional test is put there to facilitate the opportunity for the uh, second carrier to make sure it can access that network. In the broad, that's what that amendment is. There are also other amendments about how Austel will operate, and it uh, is to have regard to several matters which I won't go into, but amends uh, tariffing procedures. But the very important, uh, the very important amendment that this, uh, this bill proposes is to vary the time period for the scrutiny by the parliament of the licences that will need to be issued uh, by the government once they make the uh, selection of the second carrier. And the licence conditions are, uh, are central to the terms under which the second carrier will be able to compete uh, against telecom. And there will be industry requirements in the licensing conditions, there will be interconnection arrangements, there will be environmental, inter environmental procedures, and there will also be interne international uh, uh, arrangements that will be in these licensing conditions. They are absolutely the centrepiece of the arrangements that uh, the second carrier will need to uh, fulfil to uh, be able to. Uh, uh, to when it makes its bid to be able to successfully operate. What was proposed is that these licence conditions come to the parliament as, uh, a, a, and under the normal Act interpretation arrangements to see whether or not the parliament agrees, and if they don't, of course, they can be disallowed, and the normal period is 15 days. What this proposes to do is to collapse that 15 days down to five, and that means that there will still be parliamentary scrutiny, but under a much shortened period. That, of course, will impose a upon the government, and I'm sure the government will agree, an obligation to provide the fullest and frankest and complete uh, briefings to those uh, within the parliament who seek them, and I'm sure there won't be any difficulty with that. But this is a very major, major change in telecommunications that has been undertaken. This amendment, as the explanatory memorandum points out, is to facilitate as quickly as possible for the opportunity for the successful bidder to start the rollout of their network. And figures have been quoted of $3 billion odd dollars over a period to roll out a network. It is most important that uh, once the decision is made about that, uh, about that bidder that they are able to undertake uh, the work that needs to be done immediately. And uh, the way the sitting patterns are proposed, if this matter isn't dealt with uh, uh, expeditiously by the Senate, then these very vital items within the licences won't be dealt with until next year. And as we don't resume until the end of February, um, that would be something that uh, I think uh, all of us would not uh, want to see. 
Now, one of the key points that I wanted to raise with the government was whether or not there was a precedent to vary this time, because I think the disallowance provisions of the parliamentary essentially uh, for the proper functioning of a uh, democracy, and uh, there are occasions when you would want to collapse the time frame. And uh, there is an example which the, uh, uh, I take it would be the Attorney General's Department provided to me under the Australian Capital Ter uh, Territory Electricity Supply Bill back in 1982, where they collapsed the time period uh, down to uh, five days. But I might point out that uh, uh, that was envisaged in the case of there being an emergency and uh, we wouldn't want the power to stay off it to the convenience of the, the parliament, and that's why they chose to collapse the time period. I don't think this quite fits the same uh, uh, bill of goods in the terms that it's not an emergency, but it is of uh, fundamentally uh, major importance that uh, the government take every step that's available to it to uh, put in place the, uh, the new competitive arrangements, an inferior structure, I might say, but in any event it goes uh, uh, down the right path. And that is why, uh, on behalf of the uh, opposition, we have agreed to uh, support these, um, these amendments. Um, can I also say, given that the minister is here, and I don't know if he did hear, that we would uh, expect a full and complete explanation and briefings uh, on all the licence conditions, and also, of course, the articles uh, of association of AOTC are to be uh, subject to tabling as well. And, uh, in, in that sense, uh, they are very important decisions. And uh, as the minister knows, throughout this uh, very complicated debate, we have tried to facilitate where we can the government's program of reform, which uh, is, as I said, going in the right direction. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, with those few remarks, uh, I indicate that we support these amendments. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. All of those that opinion say aye. The, the, the honourable minister. Just very briefly. Uh, oh, sorry. The uh, honourable member asked for a number of undertakings on consultation. Uh, uh, I'm happy to oblige. Um, I also thank him for his attitude. I do agree that the stance of the opposition on these legislation now and the uh, time it was introduced has indeed been uh, helpful. The, the question is the amendments be agreed to. All those opinions say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Question now is that a report of resolution of the House. All those opinions say aye to the contrary. No, I think the ayes have it. Madam Deputy Speaker, I have to report that the committee has agreed to a resolution. Um, Parliamentary Secretary. I move the report be adopted. The question is that the report be adopted. All those that are that opinion say aye to the contrary. No, I think the ayes have it. I move the House now adjourn. The question is the House will now adjourn. All those are that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The House stands adjourned until Tuesday, 26 November 1991 at 2pm.